following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Sacrament of Penance In order to understand what penance is, we have to study (coughs) the book of Genesis and to relate it to our physical body and to the Gnostic Church because both are interrelated. Remember that it's written that our physical body is the temple of the living God and that we have to take care of it. Also, the Master Samael on the Or taught us that every single devotee or initiate, every initiate that enters into the path, immediately uh, begins the building of his own temple in the internal world. He has stated that he has a temple in the internal world and that when we go into the internal worlds and enter into that temple, Master Samael said, remember that you are entering into my consciousness, into my being. So therefore, behold here the relationship of what is the Gnostic Church in relation with the physical body and even with our own particular internal sanctuary or temple that we build upon the rock. Remember that Peter is the rock upon which we have to build our church. Of course, we always uh, state that Peter is directly related with the pineal gland, which is the seat of the soul, from which the Son of Man, Tifereth, starts the building of his own temple through the controlling of the sexual forces of Yesod, which is the rock. <coughs> so, When we see the tree of life, we have to again understand what is the altar, what is the priest, what is Christ, what are the the congregation is, and all those elements that we find in any ritual, in any uh, church, specifically in the Gnostic Church. 
If you observe the three primary forces of the tree of life, which is the first triangle, then you understand that that triangle of the logos manifests through that, as we explain in other lectures. In that, we find the Isis and the priest, or the priestess and the priest performing the ritual. There must be always two, because this priest and priestess represents in that Ava and Aima, the Divine Mother and the Holy Spirit, which of course manifest their power through Tiferet. That's why we find that in the middle of the the column, the middle, the column of the middle of the tree of life, that that receives the power of the three primary forces is directly related to Tiferet. And of course, Tiferet is a human soul, which is that soul which is incarnated into a physical body and performing the ritual, performing the ceremony, performing the work of the priesthood that each one of us has to perform. Of course, exactly from Tiferet, down in a straight line, we find the Sephira Yesod, which is unquestionably symbolized by, by the altar of any church. That's why when the, uh, we talk about uh, the altar of any church, we always state that, that so, such an altar should be made of stone. Upon this altar is where the priest and the priestess perform the ceremony that they had to, to celebrate. And of course, that ceremony is uh, husband and wife in direct, related, in direct relation with the Sephira Yesod, which is sex. And uh, in front of Yesod is Malkut, which is uh, the physical body, as we stated in other lectures. Malkut is the kingdom. And in order for the kingdom to exist, we need a king and a queen. Those uh, king and queen are the Malakim, which are direct, uh, direct related, in direct relation with the Tifereth. In the physical world, the Malakim are called for, uh, the people that are on the path the children of the kings. So these children of the kings are of course the initiates that are walking on the path in the physical world of Malkut. Because remember, I repeat, Malkut means the kingdom. It calls from Melech and Malka, which together are Malakim. So we are, in other words, the children of the kings. What well, kings, of course, the Malakim of Tifereth, where the real priest expresses itself, which is the human soul, which is also called the son of man. So visualize that in order to understand how the Gnostic Church is related with every initiate. Malkut, his physical body, is where we find the essence, the Buddha, which is a child, which is a part of Tifereth, the human soul. And that's why it's called a child. Together, children of Malakim, or children of kings, are those that walk on the path in this physical world, in Malkut. So in any congregation, in any group, what we call it Ecclesia, 
church or temple, or the people that know the secrets of that and practice these uh, sacraments, may what we call the children of Israel, or the children of the kings, the Malachim, related to those that know the mystery. So, of course, that congregation is Malkut, and uh, among them is the priests and the priestess, which are celebrating the ritual in Yesod, which is the altar. And Tiferet is the, the priest, and the priestess is, of course, Isis, which is the feminine soul, which represents Ava and Aima from that, which bring down, which of course they are the Holy Spirit, the feminine and masculine aspect of the Holy Spirit, that bring down the forces of the Logos, of Christ, Keterhochma, Bina, and even in Sof or down, that's the channel. That is how we have to understand, how we have to comprehend that. From that point of view, Remember that it's written by the Master uh, Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 5, 6. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here, the Gospel of John is telling us that we have to be born again by means of water and of the spirit. And that brings us into the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 1st, verse 2 and 3, which says, And the spirit of God move upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So here we see clear that the water and the spirit that the uh, book of John is talking about is the same spirit and water of Genesis, which is directly related with the water, uh, sexual waters of Yesod, which is the altar which is, of course, the stone upon which we have to build a rock. From there, that is why it is written, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. This is, of course, from the chapter of Genesis, number 2, that we are talking here about the river of Eden. In order to understand this river of Eden, we have to understand that there are two types of Eden. We, in many lectures we stated that Yesod is the lower Eden, the fourth dimension, and that is the upper Eden, the higher dimensions. In that is where we find Ava and Aima, which, as we stated, are the Holy Spirit bringing down the forces of the Logos directly into Tifereth and into Yesod. The mysteries of that are performed through Yesod. It is not possible, but through Yesod. And that's why, in the vital body, which is a superior part of the physical body, is where we find all the forces of this river of Eden that we are talking. As you find, for instance, that the river of Eden that uh, the book of Genesis talks about is the upper Eden, the heavenly Eden related with that, what God creates. And the garden of Eden is precisely Yesod. This is what you have to comprehend and understand. It. Two things here. So from that superior Eden, the sense a river, it says there, 
which parts in two heads, I mean in four heads. These four heads are the four elements which we always find in our vital body. It is stated that the vital body or ethereal body is the superior part of the physical body. And this vital body or ethereal body is divided in five tatwas. From the top of the head to the root of our nose by raise the tatwa of the ether, which is called akasha tatwa. And uh, down from the root of the nose to the heart, by raise the tatwa of the air, which is called vayu. From the heart, to the sex is the tatua of the fire, which is called the tatua tejas. His color is red. The color of the air is blue. And the color of the ether is black. From the sex to the knees, the tatua of the water, which is white. And is called apas. And from the knees to the feet, the tatwa of the earth, which is yellow, which is the tatwa pridvi. Tatwa is vibration of the ether. So this vibration, these four forces, of course, are coming from one river, which is the ether, which is coming from above. That's why I said from the top to the root of the nose is the ether. And you see it in the tree of life is related with the first triangle. Then, from the nose to the heart, and you find related with Tiferet, the second triangle. And from the heart to the sex, is the third triangle, Yesod. And from the, I mean from the sex to, uh, I mean from the heart to the sex, is Yesod, or the, the fire, and from the, from the sex to the knees, the water, and then the earth. Those four elements are the ones that will make the physical body. The physical body itself is the outcome of these uh, five ethers that we find in the vital body. That's why it is stated that all of those forces or elements that come from the ether and that have in foreheads, according to the book of Genesis, nourish the Garden of Eden. In the womb of our mother, of course, the blood is nourishing the physical body, and after that, when the physical body goes out of the womb, continues the vital body nourishing the physical body to the uh, ethers of the fourth dimension. This is how we have to explain, how to understand how the vital body is related with the four rivers of Eden that come from one river in order to nourish the physical body. That's why it's written in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, uh, verse 15, in Jahava Elohim, which is the holy name of the Holy Spirit, took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. When it's written there that he took the man, we had to ask ourselves from where he took him. He took him from the four elements. Because we had to build the man from the four elements. This man that we are talking here is Tifereth. Remember always that. Because Tifereth, in the Sotericism, receives the name of the Son of Man. So this Son of Man is the one that is taken from the four elements, which also represents the lower bodies that we have to build, and is placed in the Garden of Eden. 
in order to dress it and to keep it. Which means, in order to follow the commandments and the rules, in order to keep that physical body healthy and immortal. Of course, that happens uh, with us when we are in the womb of our mother. The four rivers are nourishing the physical body, but unfortunately, we live Eden, as we know and we explain in other lectures. So, this also means that the Holy Spirit forms the human being from these four elements and place him in the Garden of Eden, which is the Asod, into which a man enters again wherever he repents of his wrongdoing by following the good law. Because we are out of that. But if we follow, and then we enter again into that Eden as we state and we explain in the uh, video... Sex, the secret gate to Eden. So as we said, to dress it and to keep it means to keep and observe all the precepts of the good law of the act, obedience, to which imparts to and endows him with power to control the four elements. And that's why he drinks of the river of the water of life. But with disobedience happens the contrary. He drinks the waters of Mara. Waters which flow from the tree of good and evil. Or the tree of evil. Symbolized by the tempter. So instead of ruling the four elements, the four elements becomes to enslave the person. And this is precisely what we have to understand. That now, in this uh, moment, we are slaves of the four elements. Because we don't master the vital body, which is related with the Esod, which is related with the Garden of Eden, when the man, in the beginning, was ruling the four elements, controlling the four elements, as Moses showed us very clear, clearly in the in the Exodus, when he performs all those miracles and prodigies in front of the Pharaoh, controlling the elements. And as the Master Jesus and all the prophets also show it in the Bible and in other holy books. So, of course, we are explaining all of this in order to understand what the waters of Mara are. Because when we talk about the mem, which is water, we have to uh, emphasize here another word from the Hebrew language, mara, which is written with m, I mean mem, resh, and he, mara, which means bitter. The same word, listen carefully, mara, is applied to the bile. We have two types of biles in relation with the liver and the spleen. As you see here in the tree of life, there are two sephiroths which are above Yesod, which are Hod and Netzah. And uh, according, of course, with the Egyptian rituals, it is stated that the priest always perform the Tao cross or the Ank cross, which is a cross that you perform according to the Egyptian uh, indications from the heart to the sex and from the liver to the spleen. What is that? In the heart we have Tifereth, which as we said is the son of man, is the man itself which is a priest. And in Yasad, we have the forces of the Holy Spirit. And in the liver, we have Mara, the bile, the yellow bile related to the gallbladder. And in the spleen, 
we have the other bile, which is the black, dark bile. Here, these two biles, of course, are bitter. We had to emphasize here something very important. Because uh, the waters of Mara that the Bible talks about are in direct relation with our liver and with our spleen. Because in them we have those elements that are related with the idols that the Bible talks about when they are commanded not to worship idols, not to bend to idols. I mean, this is Tifereth, shouldn't worship any idol, any image, any negative force. But we have in those areas, those uh, elements related with anger, for instance, wrath, and all the karma. In other lectures, we talked very clear, but in the liver, we have Mars. And from Mars, uh, we have the forces related with karma, because the liver is related with the number five. Here is where we find, when we do a conjuration, we said, Elohim, Elohim, do battle for me in the name of the Tetragrammaton. These Elohim are here in this area, related with Netzah. And of course, as we always state, the liver is related with the heart, with Tifereth. Because the liver is the one that sends all the impure blood to the heart, in which Tifereth takes it and purifies it with the oxygen. And also the spleen has to be uh, related with the creation of the blood. The spleen takes a lot of uh, dark uh, uh, blood from the liver. And with uh, the solar force that it uh, absorbs to the vital body, purifies also, creates uh, white cells. The spleen itself is an organ, as you know, that has no cavities, no conducts. But only is a, a, an organ that absorbs through the arteries the forces of the vital body and the blood from the liver. So that is a relation of the blood. So the spleen contributes to the creation of blood as well as the pancreas and the stomach in this area that we are talking here, which is the fire from the heart to the sex. So then, in the liver, we have wrath, anger, and all of those defects related with these uh, negative emotions in this area of the solar plex. And also in the spleen, the spleen is related with adultery. Why is the spleen related with the adultery? Because the spleen is the organ that takes the solar force of Christ, pure solar force, into the organism from the vital body. And remember that the vital body is directly related with the sod. So from there, the spleen takes the solar force and unfortunately also takes from the liver, which we have the impure blood and the animal inheritance. So then the spleen becomes infected with the actions of the liver. And that's why it is stated in esotericism that in the spleen we have adultery. And in the liver, wrath, anger, and all of those defects. But mainly in the spleen is adultery. Anytime that we become angry or proud or any type of fear in this area, the spleen absorbs that blood from the liver and gets uh, infected. This is how also the spleen absorbs the atoms of fornication from Yesod to the liver. And this is how adultery is related with. 
That's why adultery and wrath or anger are those defects related to this area which create bitterness, karma. But of course, there is a word, as I said, mara, bitterness in Hebrew. But if you put aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the A, Aleph, which as you know, symbolizes oxygen, the wind, the air, the spirit that enters through the nose. If we put the Aleph into that Mara, and then we find the word Amar. Amar, which means is to say. That's Amar, from Aramaic and from Hebrew as well. Amar, which is very significant because in Spanish, the word Amar means to love. So meaning that when we put the oxygen of the Father of Christ, which entered to the nose, that breath of life into our heart, into our lungs, and the lungs take the impure blood from the heart, the tifereth that the heart takes, and pump it into the, into the lungs. The lungs purify that with Aleph, which is the oxygen, and returns to the heart, which is Tifereth. And from there goes down into Yesod and only to crystallize as living water. So we all hear how in the physical body is performed this beautiful alchemical transformation of elements. This is why uh, during the Lent, which endures 40 days, which is related with the letter Mem, which is the water, whether the waters of Mara or the living waters of Yasod. During that Lent, it is advised, it is stated, not to eat meat. And it's because that element nourishes, of course, the fire. But is directly related with not eating flesh, which means not to fornicate, not to feed the lustful animal elements related to this area. So this is precisely the point here in penance. Because when we work with the sacrament of penance, we are working with ours, own, with our own sins, defects, especially adultery and wrath, anger. That's why it's written that there are three doors in order to enter into hell, which is anger, fornication, which is the same as adultery, and in the same way you fornicate, you adulterate. And when you are adulterating, you are fornicating. Uh, and greed that area of here in this area of the stomach and when you have that appetite covetousness or greed hunger thirst related with penance so this is why Penance, the sacrament of penance, is the second. Because it's written. And in the chapter of Matthew, number 3, 16, 17, it's stated, And the human soul, between parentheses, Jesus, because when you hear or when you read about Jesus in the Gospels, you have to understand that he is directly related with Tifereth, the Son of Man. He is the one that is doing all of this work. So when somebody is receiving the baptism, it is the human soul, the one that is being baptized or receiving the strength of Christ. That's why it is stated, and when Jesus, or when the human soul 
when he was baptized in Yesod, of course, in the waters of Jordan, which symbolizes Yesod, went up straightway out of the creative waters of life. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, Christ, descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice, the voice of the Father, the first Logos, Keter, from heaven, saying, This is Chochmah, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Chochmah was that true light, which lightened every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of the will of God. And the word, the Logos, Chochma, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten son, Chochma, of the Father. So, this is a process, of course, of baptism, when the Lord descends, through Yesod, when we know how to control the waters of Mara, the waters of bitterness, which are related with our liver and our spleen, that unfortunately we have a lot, which, uh, which is related with our own particular karma. That's why in Judaism, when they go into the mikveh, which is the sacred bath, which always is performed on Saturday, the mysteries of Shabbat, that mikveh has the shape of the letter Vav. And the letter Vav is always related, the letter Vav is of the yod He Vav He, is always related with Tifereth. You see the relationship? Tifereth, Bav, is the human soul. And that pool within which they have that bath, which is a sacred pool, is made of Malkut, which is the earth. Because Malkut is the earth. So there they submerge themselves. That means that the Son of Man should submerge into his own earth, which is his, in this case, his wife his spouse, or her spouse, and pronounce, Kuma Adonai, Deyafutsu o Yiveha, Deyanusu, Mesaneha mi Paneha. This means, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and the conquest of the land become instantaneous. Of course, which Lord is rising there? Adonai, which is the sacred name of Malkut uh, in the world of Atiluth. Rise. In the physical body, you have to rise that force when you enter into the mikveh. Which is the same as the baptism. When you are entering then and rising that force from your soul, from your sex, up. In order to start the battle against your enemies. Which enemies? Your own ego, of course. But that is not easy. That's why it is written that when we enter into the path, when we receive the sacraments of the Gnostic Church, which in this case, in the public lecture, are the sacred knowledge 
from that. Because all the knowledge that we give is related with the sacred amens. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Which manifests through the three brains. The intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the sexual instinctual motor brain. From these three brains expresses the three primary forces. So all the lectures are directly related with that. And, and to how to handle the forces of the universe that manifest through the three brains. So the sacred amends. And of course, these sacred amends are performed in the long path of the self-realization, the path of the initiation, which is represented by the letter Mem. Related that the letter Mem is always related with the water, is always related with the Asod, which is the water. And it's always represented by the hermit, which is the number nine card of the tarot among the arcana, arcana of the tarot, the hermit. Of course, when you receive that strength, and when you are dealing with the forces of Adonai, or Adonai, which is the force of the earth, you have to understand that those forces are related also with the animal kingdom, with the plant kingdom, mineral kingdom, with the four elements. And uh, you came from those elements, those kingdoms, before entering into the human kingdom. So you have to face those forces and to overcome them. And that's why we have inside of us three aspects of our inner being that we had to fight. Immediately when we receive this sacrament, this knowledge, and immediately after we start practicing the holy sacrament of the Gnostic Church, which is the Arcanum AZF, the Sahaja Maituna, or as we explained in the previous lecture, the baptism. Because Adonai is rising. Kuma Adonai, arise Lord. That energy rises in the spinal column and gives you a sword with what you have to fight the enemies inside. But then you have to face the three guardians of the threshold. And this is related with penances. Because the three guardians of the, the threshold are related with the path that we had to walk in the middle of the, spine, uh, uh, the, the tree of life, the middle column, in which we had to face first one uh, guardian, another guardian, and another guardian. And it's written, of course, in the Bible, in the Gospels. It is written that when Jesus was baptized, immediately after the next chapter of the book of Matthew, is, it is written, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That's precisely the ordeal or the penance that he is going to, uh, to, to, to begin. And that's why that penance is stated in the gospel that he was 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. He had three temptations. Not two, not one, but three. Why? Because these temptations are related to the ordeals of the three guardians of the threshold, which the Master Samael on Veor states in the, uh, in the book Pisti Sophia, the following. The guardian of the threshold can never be disintegrated because it is part of our individual being. The guardian of the threshold is a full length mirror that shows us the psychological state in which we find ourselves at each given moment. We have the guardian of the threshold in the astral, in the mental, 
and in the causal planes. There are three guardians of the threshold, three parts of our own individual being. Each one of the three parts is autonomous, individual, and self-cognizant. Peace to Sophia. In other words, Jesus has had and has, but he overcame these three guardians. You have them. Everybody has them within. So this devil that is written in Matthew is not a devil that is outside. It's inside of each one of us. It's part of our being. Unfortunately, is transformed into Satan because we are fall into temptation or we fell into temptation and that's why that uh, marvelous aspect of that uh, uh, guardian of the threshold which is called Lucifer before the fall became Satan inside of us which reflects all the ego that we have within but this Lucifer or Satan has his center of gravity in Yesod. That's why Dante Alighieri in his Divine Comedy found Lucifer in the ninth sphere, which is Yesod. And there is where we have it. And this is why many Kabbalists misinterpret the forces of the cosmos and nature in relation with Samael on the or. Samael, as you know, is the logos of Mars. And Mars governs. Up there in the head, in the uh, sign of Aries. But down in sex, in the sign of Scorpio, Scorpius also is ruled by Mars, Samael. So we have here two signs in which Samael rules, Aries and Scorpio. Of course, in Scorpio, as you see, is where we find all of those forces related with the fire of sex, related with the liver, related with the spleen, which is the venom, blood, that brings from the animal kingdom all the forces of the animal kingdom in each one of us. And that is in relation with the fire, with the forces of Samael. That's why Samael is always stated in the, in the books of Kabbalah, related with the original sin. Because one thing is Samael on the or there in the center of the planet Mars as Logos. Another thing is Samael on the or, his Bodhisattva, that came to Mexico and that delivered this knowledge. And another thing is our own particular individual Samael, which is the strength, the own, the sexual force in our own particular bodies. And this is what we have to comprehend. Because every archangel has its exponent or his exponent in the physical body and internal bodies. Michael, for instance, who is the archangel of the sun, is related with sulfur in relation with fire also in our physical body. So we have to study this astrological esotericism in order to understand what is that particular inside of us and what is the archangel outside of us. But they are related. That's why the master says, I know all of you very well. You cannot hide from me. And we ask him, why? Because my being is connected to all those particulars of Samael which are in each one of you. Because you have particulars of Samael, of Michael, of Zachariel, and Orifiel, and all the cosmos in you because you are the microcosmos of the macrocosmos. It is something that we have to understand and comprehend. And this is how when Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, 
in order to be tempted by the devil. This wilderness, of course, symbolizes, again, Yesod and also the world of Malkut. Because the world of Malkut is a fallen Sephirah, in which we are. And there is what we find also in the book of Revelation, that when you enter into the path, the second church, or the book of Revelations, Chapter 2, verse 10 says, Fear not of those things without thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Ten days, is related with the, the will of samsara, Malkut. That means that when you receive the forces of baptism and you start initiation, immediately you are going to be tested here in Malkut, which is the number 10, 10 days, in, re- in order to pay your karma, the recurrent karma, and all those negative forces that I, I explained are in relation with Mara, the bitter waters. Now, let us understand this. I told you the, that the word uh, Amar means to say. When you put Aleph at the beginning, right? There are two words which are similar to this. For instance, the blood which is created in the liver and with the spleen is called dam in Hebrew. So dam, the blood goes into the heart and when it receives the letter Aleph, which is the oxygen, becomes Adam. So this Adam is Tifereth because there is where dam becomes Adam. There's always we insist the son of man is Tifereth is that oxygenated, purified blood that goes down into your sod and becomes semen, the seed. And that's why in Kabbalah you represent in your sod the man being built, being created. In your sod you build the church, you build the man. And also Mara, the bitter waters of the liver and the spleen, the two bials become sweet when you put Aleph in the front of that word Mara and is Amar. Amar. Amar means to say or to love in Spanish. And this is how you understand why it is written in the book of Genesis, which is related with the waters. It says, after the God was floating on the water, it says, and God said when you read in Genesis said you read the word amar means that God said amar that means something that Aleph which is the wind the spirit is doing the creation in Yesod in here because the waters of Mara are in the liver and the spleen going to Yesod the purified water when you transmute them in that there is Amar. So that's why we always state. In order for you to create the man within you. You have to know how to Amar. Or to love in Spanish. Or to say. Because God has to say it. And God said it through the sexual force. God as Aleph descends from the higher dimensions down into the heart and into your sod in order to rise again inside of your spinal column which is the staff of Moses which is the serpent of bronze and when that happens and then is Amar God said there there be light and there was light so you see that is in relation with your own particular 
physical body. If you don't take into account God in the sexual act, and then you fornicate. You follow the bitter waters of your liver and your spleen, which is adultery and wrath. Because in the, in the liver you find, of course, violence, which is wrath as well. And it is written that Lilith is a mother of violence. All the multi-generated aspects of sexuality. And in the other side, in the spleen, you have Nahema. So Lilith and Nahema are the two opposite of forces, animal forces, demoniacal forces, which are the opposite of Adam, of Tifereth, which channel the forces of Adam and Eve, Ava and Aima. Here, the conjuration that we state in the conjuration of the seventh, we say, in the name of Adam and Eve, who are Yahava, or Yod Hava, or Ava and Aima, be gone, Lilith, from the liver. Let us rest in peace, Nahema, from the spleen. Because those forces are there, which are related to Klipoth, the inferior forces of Mara, the bitterness of our own subconsciousness, unconsciousness, and infraconsciousness. And all the chakras, all the, the area of the solar plexus, where we have appetites, the animal appetites. That's why it says that the devil will try you when you start. This is precisely what happened with every a single neophyte or beginner. When they start into the path, they feel that they are tried. The devil inside of you starts because it's more, we are 97% animal and 3% human. Now we want to increase the 3% of our humanity against the 97%. It is like David against Goliath. But we have faith in God, we advance. The ordeals that the devil is putting us but not outside, inside. And that we have, we have to be patient. And that Lent, that induced 40 days. But uh, in order to comprehend, and the book of Exodus is better, because it says that the Israelites were 40 years, means the whole life in the wilderness. 40 is always related to men. It doesn't mean that in 40 days you will, you will be ready, or in 40 years. It's just a symbol of the long or the length of time that you have to work with your penances, with your ordeals, with your trials, which come from within. And of course, the interior is a reflection of the exterior and the exterior of the interior. The circumstances of life that are around your physical body relates to your inner psychology. This is why it is written that when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. So you, do you understand that? 40 is related with Mem, as I said, with those waters of Mara and the living waters of sexuality. So after you fast, in other words, after you start transmuting and fighting against your animality, you start, or your, either, your, your ego, your, your body, your, your inner self, start being hungry, desires in this area of the stomach, lust, anger, pride, fear, gluttony, all of those defects in relation with this area of the liver and the spleen and the sex, of course, as well. You are hungry. And then the tempter comes and tells you, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones of Yesod be made bread. Remember that the stones... Is let all with the Assad. If you are a son of God, if you are following the path of God, Tifereth, 
Why don't you transform these stones into bread? What is the bread? I mean, this is directly related with Tiferet, the human soul. It's the human soul that is being tried there. You make bread when you uh, make the flour of the wheat and cook it in fire. Remember that the bread doesn't grow up in trees. You don't take bread in trees. You have to make it. So to make bread is a process of alchemy where you find fire, water, and earth. The, the flour. And even is air there. So, to make bread is means to perform alchemy. To transmute and to enjoy sex just for the animal aspect of it. Which, of course, in the beginning, Paul of Tarsus says we had to be the first is the animal, the natural, because we have lust. But we have to transmute it. But Jesus, we represent the son of man, answer. Man, which is the son of man, Tifereth, shall not live by bread alone. Not only by sexual transmutation. But by every word that proceedeth out of that. Because here in that is in the larynx. The mouth of God. Here is in that. Do you see the difference? From that comes the word, the logos. Our aspiration, higher aspiration must be the incarnation of the logos. But always the nourishment of that logos in our physical body. That means, in other words, that you shouldn't only practice sexual magic and receive that. You think that only to sexual magic or the arcanum F, you will acquire self-realization. You need also to feed your soul. The man also needs the word of God. Remember that Tiferet is the man. The bread of alchemy comes from Yasad when you transmute the waters of Yasad. But the word of God comes from that which is above Tifereth. And in order for Tifereth to receive the word of God, that's why Jesus instituted the Eucharist. Because uh, through the Eucharist, you feed also your soul, your heart. That's why it is written that the sacrament of Eucharist is related with the heart, with Tifereth, where he receives the forces of the Logos, the forces of Christ, in order to be fed and to be guided. That's why the Eucharist is something indispensable. And also because in different steps, the Logos descends from above. Or in other words, when you are practicing sexual magic, you have to remember Ava and Aima. Remember that the fourth commandment of the law of God states, Honor your father and your mother. And you know already, through the lecture that we gave many times, that your father and your mother is Adam and Eve. The two polarities which are precisely in Yesod and which are, are the polarities which are above in Da'at. That's why it's written that the men, Tifereth, will leave Da'at, father and mother, and will go into Yesod and have his own wife and will want flesh. That is to honor father and mother, to remember God in the sexual act. Of course, when you are remembering God, you are bringing the word of God, the forces that we call the Akashic forces into, you, into the sexual act. When you transmute it, then you are feeding yourself with the mana, 
with the forces of the higher, with your own bread. That's why Jesus says, because the devil, in this uh, case, which represents the guardian of the threshold of the astral plane, which is related with the emotions, with the appetites in this area of the solar plex, says, what don't you transmute? Transform, make these stones of your thought be bread of alchemy. And then Jesus answered, mm, not only of that type of bread should the man live, but also by the forces that come from above from that, from the word that of God, which is the Gnostic church of the superior worlds. That is necessary to understand because uh, we need to know those mysteries. That not only sexual magic is necessary, but also other type of rituals that were instituted by the great avatars and that we Gnostics have it. So then you understand what is to work against the forces of the liver, which is the forces of, of, of Satan, in this case of the devil there, tempting you to feed your hunger. That's why at any type of the moment when you feel hunger or this type of appetites in this area, remember that guardian of the threshold that is showing you your appetites. And you have to defeat that by telling to this... Uh, uh, Threshold, guardian of the threshold, ah, just, just a moment. Not only of that type of bread, me, the human soul, should live alone, but also by the word of that, the forces of the superior forces of that, that comes from God. And this is how, as you see in the tree of life, Tifres is exactly in the middle. He is fed by above and below. Don't forget that. Because the devil is always sly. He can take you out of the forces from above and thinking that just by doing the practice below, you are done. No. Remember that God said. And that said means amar. Which is the Aleph. So you have to remember always that force coming down and only to say it. It is a process of, uh, of transmutation. And that comes, of course, along the path. But when you acquire the building, listen carefully, inside of you, of your astral body, and your mental body, then is, uh, you are accomplished what is written in the book of Genesis that says, now let us make... Uh, Meet, meet, uh, how you call this? Uh, meet mate. Helpmate, yeah, for Adam in the book of Genesis. And then after that, uh, in the chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, is where you find that uh, God make uh, the beasts of the wild and the folds of the air. Only those. The beasts of the wild are represented by fire, the astral body. And the folds of the air, the mental body. Because when you have these four bodies, the folds of the air, and the beasts of the wild, which are the fire, the astral body, you already have, of course, Yesod, which is the fish of the ocean, and Malkut, which is your physical body, which is the cattle of the earth. So that's, those are the four elements, or the four creatures that are called in Hebrew, Hayot HaKadosh, the sacred creatures, angelic forces, because are, are created by the force of transmutation. So then, when you have all of that, you have to face the guardian of the mental plane. Because you are reaching 
what we call the pinnacle of your temple. Why? Because the astral body manifests to the emotional brain and the mental body through the mental brain, which is the intellectual brain here in the head. And that is the pinnacle of your temple. So when you have a solar mind and an astral solar body, you already are building the pinnacle of your temple. When you are at that height, then the guardian or the threshold of the mind comes to you. And then he's going to tell you this. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels church concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You see again there? The stone. In other words, the devil is telling him, Go down to Yesod when you reach that level. And of course, uh, uh, continue or perform what you have to perform by going down into Yesod. So this Hayot HaKadosh is the four uh, forces that in the beginning we were saying are related with the four elements that are related with the creation of the physical body. But here, are related with the physical body, vital body, astral body, and mental body, in which the initiation is already a Buddha. That is a level of Buddha. And as a Buddha, he receives that ordeal of the threshold, of the guardian of the mental plane, of the mental level. And he has to defeat it. From that pinnacle of the temple, he says, go down. And uh, because uh, it is written that his angels will take care of you. What angels he's talking about? These angels are precisely the four holy creatures. If you remember, for instance, when somebody enters into meditation and controls First, the first uh, uh, haya, which is the physical body, relax it. And then control the vital body, which is the other haya, or beast, related, which is in relation with the man. And then enter into meditation and quiets the emotional body, which is related with the lion. So when the lion is quiet then you have to silence the mind, which is the eagle. Those are the four uh, creatures. The bull, the man in Yesod, the lion in Hod, and the eagle in Netzach. Hayot HaKadosh, holy creatures are called. Those are the four creatures that will take hold of you when you go to Yesod. And of course, this is precisely what happened uh, in the book of Numbers. When uh, people were reaching that level, they were uh, disquiet and unhappy because many ordeals were coming unto them. Because in a mental plane, you have to face humanity and very hard ordeals related with all the elements. You hear about the four elements or the four ordeals of the water, the, 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 the earth, the air, and, and the fire that we have to face in different levels as we are advancing. And this is what is written there in Matthew. Jesus is doing that and facing that. And that's what is written that Jesus uh, answer. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. 
You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Because at this time, he is at the level of Netzah. You don't have to tempt your God at that time in doing what you want. You have to start following the will of your inner being in relation with sexuality. It's not, you see, many uh, students want to know when those will start following direct, directly for my inner being how to perform sexual magic and, and how and where. Well, when you reach that level, then you are in the pinnacle of the temple. So you have to do the will of your God. Not to go there and start doing your own will, because there you are tempting your God. Remember that the devil resides in your sod. To tempt your God is to do the things of your own will. Because that, after that, after the mind, you follow your pineal gland, which is the will, Tiferet. And that's why it is stated that Jesus said, You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. It comes to my mind the book of Numbers. When the Israelites were tempting Moses, which was the representation of Christ, saying, We are in the wilderness and we don't have even water. And they are tempting him because they want, of course, uh, somehow transmutation, transformation. But they are in such an ordeal that they shall only obey the law of God. And God is tempted, of course, to give them water from a rock. That rock is Yesod. And only to satisfy their thirst. But this is in relation, of course, with the animality that we have within. Because sometimes we want sex not because of God, but because of our own lust that still is alive within us. And we have to overcome the guardian of the mental plane here. And we overcome it. Or we will say, Jesus overcome that guardian. And then comes the third temptation, which is the guardian of the threshold in the causal plane. When you reach that level, from Netzai to Tifereth, and is when you receive the mastery. You have the right to be called master or human being, because you have built the bridge from the physical body to the monad. And that precisely is acquired in the first mountain. You read that in the three mountains. When you reach that level, you reach the first mountain. Because the serpents of Geburah and Hesed, or the divine soul and spirit, are always standing. So when you reach the level of Tifereth, you already are on the top of the first mountain. But then you have to face the third guardian there. Which is part of your being. An Irvanic guardian. It is written... Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. This is the first mountain. And showed, and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You see, because from here is the causal world, you can see down all the kingdoms of the world of Malkut. And the devil said unto him, all these things will I give you, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That, of course, has many meanings. But in this case, that we are explaining here, is an ordeal in which you have to, uh, to boast about your mastery. In which you have to say, so oh, I am this, I am that. The master this, the master that, worship me. I am, of course, uh, a certain hierarchy and all of that. And of course, your mind take control. Or the guardian, or the, at that level, take control of, of, of your destiny. That's why there are two paths at that level. The spiral path, and the direct path. And that's why 
Master Jesus says. Getting hence Satan, or guarding of the threshold of the, of the castle of the world, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You have to put your mind under the service of your own being, and you as a human soul have to follow the will of God. That's very delicate because it's the will that is in trial there. So see, this is the, the, the level in which you are going up through Yesod in that Lent that is written uh, in the Gospels that Jesus passed 40 days and 40 nights. It's not like what's literally 40 days and 40 nights. It's a symbol of something that you have to endure step by step. Many human souls take the spiral path. And the Master says in one of his books, these Buddhas of Nirvana like to unread themselves as women and to show their beauty in front of everybody and like to have followers. But we have to stop, he says, and to renounce the happiness of Nirvana and follow the direct path. It's very rare the one that overcomes the guardian of the causal world. Many of the Buddhas that enter into Nirvana to rest and to forget about humanity. Because the one that takes the direct path, the guardian tells him, okay. So you are following the direct path. Let me tell you what the future awaits for you. So the guardian will tell you in detail what is w going to happen in your path. Since you don't want to, uh, to have the kingdoms of the earth as I am offering you, happiness in Nirvana, and to incarnate once in a while in the physical plane, you are rejecting that, okay, here is what you will receive. And of course, you will receive his karma. And after that, that's why it's written, that after those three temptations, Jesus appears as a master already. In the, the town of Galilee, which is the Gentiles, in Malkut, renounce, he renounced, of course, all of those things, all the three temptations, or the three guardians of the threshold. When I am talking about this, it comes into my mind this very moment, the Master Samael on Veor. He was in jail, as you see, we have a new website when we are putting all the steps when the Master was in jail. It happens that he was in jail in the, in the month of March, and the month of March is related with Pisces. In other words, he was all of his ordeal of jail in under the sign of Pisces. And Pisces is controlled by Neptune that rules the pineal gland and I control the sexual waters of Yasod Mem. So he was here accomplishing, in other words, certain prophecies. He went out of the ordeal of water that Neptune was putting him as Odysseus and the Odyssey. When he receives all the ordeals of water, as you read the Odyssey of Homer, by Neptune, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit that took Jesus into the wilderness in order to be trial. Same meaning. Of course, Master Samael on the oar got out of the jail when he was only passing the ordeal of water of the second initiation of Mayor Mysteries. But let me tell you that that ordeal of the water endures the whole life in different levels. <coughs> and of course, uh, this is very, very significant to understand that, that even in the life of the Master, he passed the ordeal of the water in the sign of Pisces, and he was the avatar. And uh, 
when that happens, after you get from that ordeal, then John is put in jail and is decapitated. That decapitation is a symbol of the mundane mind that we have that should be put aside. Of course, this length of 40 days that we are explaining here is a penance that we have to endure, all of us, in different levels according to our own particular karma. We cannot say that you, in the way that the Master Samael lived his own karma, you have to live it. Or in the way that Jesus did it, no. Because they had different levels of being. Jesus was a Paramartha Satya. He was representing all of this with his own life. Master Samael also was represented with his own life, according to the 20th century. These things, when we study his, uh, the story of his life, but according to his own level, because the Master Samael is a lower level than Jesus. And we, of course, are very low in relation with the level of Jesus and Samael on the earth. But each one of us, when we walk in the path, we live our own ordeals in relation with the waters of bitterness, Mara, the liver and the spleen. Because those are the main ones, Lilith and Nahema, which are the forces that are inside of us in relation even with our physical body. So, that's why, let me read for you what each one of us has to achieve by overcoming these three ordeals of the Garden of the Threshold, these ordeals of water, earth, fire, and air, when we reach the self-realization. In the book of uh, the Bhagavad Gita, written by Krishna, it is stated, The Holy Lord Supreme said, who, He who performs his spiritual duty without desiring the fruits of his actions, he is the true renouncer of the world, and not the one who renounces action, or who worships the fire. Know that the one who performs karma yoga, which is precisely related with penances, action, which also is called renunciation, is the one who is known to be a samyasa. Because none can attain this yoga, union with God, without giving up desires. For the wise who has just begun this yoga, action is said to be the means. And after attaining this yoga, mindlessness, mindness, mindness, is going to be action, or the means of his actions. When the devotee does not act either for sense gratification or for the fruit of his actions, and when he has renounced to all desires, driven thoughts, it is stated that he has attained yoga, union with God. Let the man lift himself by himself. Let this man not degrade himself the self is indeed friend to the self, and the self is also the enemy of the self. For him who has conquered his self by the self, his self is indeed his best friend. But for him who has not conquered his self, the self remains his enemy. The self-conquered peaceful self is the supreme self. For him, call, heat, happiness, or sorrow, respect or disrespect are the same. This devotee, who is counted with knowledge and wisdom, who is mentally stable and a master of his senses, and who regards rubbish or a stone or gold as the same, such a self-realized soul 
Isa Samyasa. Or as the Master Samael says, as Samyasin. He is the self-supreme who maintains the same attitude towards his well-wishers, friends, enemies, non-aligned arbitrators, haters, relations, saints, and sinners. Let this Samyasa constantly remember himself as if to be found alone in a secluded place, self-control without desires and without any sense of possessiveness. This is the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, 1 to 10. So this is the achievement that any initiate has to achieve. And that Jesus achieved, Moses achieved, Krishna achieved, and many other great masters. Buddha achieved it also. This coming now, when we talk about Mara, which is the bitter waters, I forgot to tell you that Mara is the name of that uh, enemy of Buddha who has three daughters that tempt the Buddha when he is in meditation. So here found the relationship of Mara, the dragon, or the darkness that tempted Buddha. That's why uh, when Jesus appears after the temptation and conquers all of this that we are explaining here, he appears to the multitudes and starts teaching them. And the first thing that he states in the book, uh, book of Matthew is the following. Ye have heard that it was said by the, them of all time. Thou shalt not kill. This is related with the liver. Wrath. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I said unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means worthless, shall be in the danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in the danger of hell of fire. Because any action that comes here as enmity, as hatred against anybody, comes from the liver, from Mara. And immediately you are feeding the enemy, which is your own particular individual Satan, your ego. And related to the spleen, the other part of this Mara, this bitterness, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I said unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Because that impure blood comes to the heart, and in the heart is Aleph, God, that knows very well. And you mix that, that desire, with your blood, with your heart, with your soul, and this is how you commit adultery in your heart. You see, it's something that you have to be always alert and attentive of your own self. So here, of course, we have cited many verses of the Gospels and the Bible in order for us to explain and to understand that the sacrament of penance that the Gnostic Church teaches and that is followed by many uh, neophytes is in relation with the initiation. Everybody has to pass for that. And most of us, of course, there are certain penances and uh, uh, works that we perform in order to pay karma. Comes into my mind, for instance, the, this custom of the Buddhists in Tibet, that in order to go to a sacred place, they straight their hands up and they stretch down onto the earth and they go like that, standing and stretching themselves, facing down into the ground until they reach the place. And it's stated that through this way, they pay their own karma. Not know the whole of it. 
But of course, it is because it's an exercise or it's a movement, as you see, related with all of this area in which you are, of course, with chanting of mantras and praying to God, channeling the forces of above in order to release the negative forces of your body, your vital body, etc. And all of those penances and sacrifices have an intention, a goal that sometimes works. There are other penances and, and, and uh, uh, how do you call uh, ordeals that people put them themselves in order to, to receive help. Posterities. Austerities, yeah. Austerities and penances. In different, uh, in different religions. Christianity, Buddhism, in Islam, you find uh, different things that they do, or like uh, fasting, etc. But of course, let me tell you about Hinduism and Christianity, because in their temple they have statues of different saints, of different masters, different forces. And people think, oh, they worship idols. No. Those statues represent the forces of nature. Anybody that is following his liver and his spleen and his lust is, a, is a, uh, uh, an idol worshiper because has inside that, those elements. But those statues or uh, sculptures that we find in these religions, sometimes they are guarded inside by elemental forces that the superior gods or the superior masters put inside of them and only to give unto the people that go and do those penances and sacrifices, help. And this is what you ignore. The people go and they have faith in a certain master, in a certain saint or God, and do their certain penances in order to receive help. And if they really deserve it, the elemental force which is in that statue is going to receive or, or to give that force to those people or to that, he, uh, that healing force. All depends, of course, of course, according to the law of karma. It comes into my mind, in relation with penances in these statues, what the Master Samael on Veor uh, taught us in Mexico. He was telling us in a lecture that when the, you go into those uh, churches that people worship and put their heart in those saints or sculptures, statues, that uh, are guarded by elementals. And sometimes the elementals are there waiting for the, for the practitioner or the devotee in order to uh, apply energy according to the law to those that deserve it. But sometimes it says that those elementals get tired of being inside there. So they move the statue down and sit down in the benches of the church or the temples. When the, the devotees enter, because they are asleep, sometimes they look and they see sit down at the bench a person that is similar to the saint of his devotion. And he says, he looks like that uh, uh, saint that I worship, or that God that I worship anyhow, but he doesn't pay attention that really is the statue that came down from the place where he, it was in order to rest. And after that, it returns. Because even, he says, they go to the place where the statue was, and they look that it's empty. And, and he says, oh, they took the statue out maybe to clean it. But meanwhile, he doesn't realize that it was seated there. And it's because you don't know many mysteries, he says, that happen with the elemental forces that sometimes the master utilize statues or that made of mineral in order to help. And that's very natural. And he says, and I think that I committed a mistake here because you may be, be in danger if you discover that. I say that because they respect me. And I always find there and I know what's going on. But when you are asleep, if you discover some things like that, you might be die because of that, he says. But I don't think that you will discover it because you are asleep. But anyhow, be careful. Don't be so obvious, I said, when you discover that because these elementals are very jealous and they don't want to be discovered. Do you have questions?
Yeah, of course. Penances and meditation. The main here is that in order to advance in these penances, we have to meditate. Meditation is the clue in order to comprehend our own desires, our own defects and vices. There are many types of meditation, but the main one is the comprehension of the ego. Remember that the ego hides in the 49 levels of the mind. And uh, that's why it is written that Jesus was in the wilderness. What was he doing there? Meditating, of course. Because that's the path of the yogi. When the yogi just meditates. The master explains in one of his books that when Jesus was in the wilderness, he was showing the path of the yogi. The path of meditation. In seclusion, when you meditate, comprehend, and ask for annihilation, because there is there a communion of the soul with the superior forces, with God, and the ordeals that the devil is putting you in your life. So that's why you have to meditate. Every time that the devil tempts you in your daily life, you have to go and meditate and remember Jesus in the wilderness. Close your eyes, concentrate, and meditate, comprehend the ego, and say to your ego, you shall not tempt me, because I comprehend this, I comprehend that, and you will die now. The annihilation of your defects comes to, in that way, after comprehension. It is not written that Jesus was walking, as many think, that was just doing the, the, the death in motion, they say. And that he was eliminating egos just like that. No, he was in meditation in order to comprehend the ego and to annihilate it. That's a real sacrament of penance taught by the Gnostic Church. What's your question? How important is the exercises of Lamasari that we taught in order to uh, heal the liver, the spleen, all those organs? Of course, they are important. This is related precisely with penance that we are talking here. The way in which we attract the superior forces of God, or the war of God, as Jesus says, in order to act in our body. Remember that not only of bread alone is the human soul uh, going to live, but also with other practices. And the uh, Lamasery practices, of course, or these practices of rejuvenation, are related with certain plexus, with certain areas of the body related with the forces that we need to put in activity and to transform because we have too much bile, bitterness, mara inside of our liver and the spleen. And you sweet that water of your liver and your spleen, not only by transmutation, by comprehension. Because every type of bitterness in this area of your solar plex is related with defects, vices, and errors that we have within. Everything that is in relation with the cleanse of the physical body or the temple of God is good. Any type of cleanse. Right? Uh, fasting. In all religions, you hear about this cleanse of the physical body, fastings, penances, because this is related with your work. You have to overcome your sins, your sicknesses. And this is because the sicknesses come from your ego. And this is how you work. That's why the Master gave the books, uh, Book of Medicine, the Ignus Rose, in order to assist yourself, to help yourself. That's why he instituted the second chamber, in order to assist ourselves because it's too much filthiness inside of us, physically and psychologically, that if we forget that we need help of God, if we think that we are just by bread alone, just by sexual transmutation, you are wrong. That's why uh, the Gnostic Church has a lot of practices. What is your question? Well, the, man, uh, the minor mysteries is precisely, the, as we say, the, the, probat the probat probationary, the probationary path, right, before entering into the major mysteries. But it's always related with the Asad, because uh, the nine uh, uh, initiations of minor mysteries are related, of course, as you said, nine 
with the world of Yisrael, with chastity. Those initiations are the probationary path and uh, that are comes to you whether you are single or, or married. A married person passes very fast. But that is, is in relation, of course, with the three guardians of the wilderness. When you enter and practice sexual magic in the beginning, you pass these nine minor initiations very fast because you are working with three forces. The two men and women and the third, which is God, of course, in the union, the Holy Spirit. When you are single, you are working only with one force. But you are advancing, of course, at a certain limit when you have to be married in order to keep up ahead in your path. Because Lucifer has to give you the, the fruit, but you have to smell it, not bite it. So, remember, once you enter and start practicing, you enter in your Lent, which endures your whole life in different Lents, in different periods of initiations that you had to confront. Lent is a period of 40 days, or 40, related with, with Mem. This is what is Lent. 40 days. That's why... For instance, right now, according to uh, Christianity, Catholicism, I believe, or maybe Orthodox as well, they are uh, celebrating the Lent that is started in uh, Ash Wednesday until the Holy Week, which is Holy Friday. It's 40 days. Those 40 days that you see, if you study the life of Jesus, start uh, very long, all the path of the cross until the crucifixion. And all of that is painful, karmic. All of that is the Lent or the 40 days of flood. 40 days of the Israelites in the wilderness. 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. And as to... Do we have uh, other questions? Thank you very much. And have a good weekend. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.